King and welcome to Conference of Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello and our Tuesday night Bible study. So we're going to continue to get into the Word of God and uh, uh, God is preparing His glorious church and His holy bride for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we need to uh, know the truth. We need to know the Word of God. We need to know what, what Jesus has done for us and uh, allow Him to form us into that image of Christ and uh, make us ready when he comes and knocks, we can immediately go with him, amen, and uh, get our inheritance, praise God, of eternal life in heaven with him, amen. Let's take a moment before we get into the word this evening, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to take a moment to pray. I want to welcome everybody on Facebook Live as well as free conference call, and uh, pray that uh, God will bless you and uh, open up your ears to hear what the Spirit says to his church. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I just want to thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness in the land of the living and all that you do and are doing for us. I thank you for your word and your spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come to lead us and guide us in all the truth, to open the eyes of our understanding that that word can work effectually in us. Lord, we want to uh, uh, just pray that uh, uh, this uh, word will be anointed of you. And uh, we'll bring forth uh, 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 the, the kingdom of God and power in each one of our lives as you uh, prepare us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will transform our lives that that word will be rooted in our hearts and bear the fruits of your kingdom so that we can do and be all that you call us to be. Lord, I just pray that you orchestrate all things according to your will and purpose and to be glorified in everything that is said and done. And uh, have your way here tonight, Lord God. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you'll uh, work mightily and powerfully, Lord God, to bring conviction, to bring repentance, and to bring transformation of all of our lives as you perfect us in your image. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, praise God. Again, we just want to welcome you to our Tuesday night Bible study. And uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, the dunamis power of God. And, and really what we're, what we're dealing with is, is uh, getting the church ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we just look at the signs around us, things are accelerating, things are moving faster and faster. Uh, we are seeing prophecies being fulfilled, things taking place that all line up with what God has prophesied would take place for the coming of Jesus Christ. We're in those birth pains. We're seeing the, the days of sorrow coming forth upon this earth, which means that we are getting closer and closer to the time of the tribulation. That means we need to get ready. We need to be make sure that we're in the right place and in the right condition uh, to be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. Are we doing the things that God has called us to do? And, you know, it's very sad, but uh, we have many people today that profess Christ that have never really heard the full gospel being preached. They've never heard uh, the full redemptive work of Christ. And so for many in the church today, uh, they don't understand uh, what Jesus came to do. And uh, we, we need to get a hold of these truths because, again, uh, there are many that do not show the evidence of a true born-again experience. Like Jesus said, there's many. And again, he always uses the, 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 the more rather than the less. Many on the wide world of destruction in the church. Many that he says will say in that day, Lord, Lord, and, and are even doing things in the church. And yet Jesus says, they're not saved, and, and uh, he, he, he tells them that uh, basically they're still in a condition of lawlessness. And that's a dangerous place to be. We have to understand that Jesus Christ came uh, basically to make us into a brand new creation, whereby we have a, a new heart, we have a, a new mind, we have a new way of thinking. I mean, he came to transform everything in us and to make us like him that uh, our nature and character would be like him. We would think like him. We walk as Jesus walked. We, we act like him because he changes everything in our life. So we have a new, a new spirit, a new mind, a new heart. He gives us a brand new nature. He puts his Holy Spirit inside of us. And, and, and uh, that Holy Spirit is there to lead us, to guide us, and to uh, direct us into the will of God and uh, to... to uh, uh, enable us to carry out God's will and purpose upon this earth. So, so we really need to understand these things of, of what Jesus came to do, why he came to do it, and we need to embrace it in our own lives and make sure, uh, I, I just did a sermon a couple weeks ago on 
examine ourselves. We need to check ourselves out. Are we really in the faith? Are we really ready? Are we showing the evidence that we are true born-again children of God and we are walking uh, in the obedience of God as new creations, living a new life and, and uh, uh, re really revealing Christ upon this earth uh, through our nature and character? That's what it comes down to. So, so we really need to wake up to these things. Now, last week we left off, we were talking about some of the purposes of the law. And uh, uh, basically the law under the old covenant was a temporary fix until the coming of grace when everything would change from the law to grace. That's what Jesus came. Jesus came to bring us a salvation by grace through faith. So the law was a temporary fix. His purpose was number one, to expose sin. In other words, to make sin sinful, to define what sin is based on the nature and character of God who gives us the law, okay? So on one hand, the, 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 the uh, uh, law was given to, to tell us what sin is. And uh, we also looked in, in uh, Galatians where he tells us that it was added because of transgressions. In other words, it was kind of a restraint, a means of restraint so that the people of God could uh, uh, be restrained from their sin and obey God so that he could uh, abide with them and be with them uh, as, his, as their God and him, them being his people. The law was given to reveal what sin is. It was also given to maintain this relationship with God until uh, faith came, until Jesus Christ came with a new covenant based on, on faith and grace. And so uh, this, this uh, again, the law was a temporary fix to allow people to maintain that relationship by following these rules and regulations uh, as were given to uh, by, by God to Moses and then to the Israel. So I'll pick up there. I want to look about a little bit about uh, the 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 uh, this law and uh, uh, again what Jesus came to do uh, to resolve this issue uh, that had to do with Israel being under the law and uh, why they were under the law and what Jesus came to do so that we would not be under the law today. We would have a whole new system, a whole new covenant, again, that's based on uh, not outward rules and regulations, but an inward transformation of our hearts. Amen. So we have to see that while the law of the old covenant shows us by rules and regulations how to walk in right relationship with God, the problem with the law is it is unable to produce that righteousness and thereby empower us to carry out that walk. In other words, the law had some issues. It, had, it didn't have the power to actually touch or change the inward part of man, which is where the real problem with Israel was. And uh, we've talked about that numerous times. Uh, the problem with the law was that man's heart was wicked. He was born with a sin nature, which caused him to sin. And so as long as that nature is within us, it is, it, it is a, 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 a slavery, a, a, a force within us that makes us commit sin. And so uh, it, it cannot actually change the inside of man and make us, uh, set us free from that power of sin. So the result is habitual disobedience. As we read through the Old Testament, we see that Israel they kept breaking the law. They kept going into idolatry, disobedience, and uh, uh, unbelief, and, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, faithlessness with God. And so uh, they were continually disobedient. God had to continually judge them because of their disobedience. And again, the source, uh, the root of their disobedience was the nature of sin within them. Not only is this sin nature unchanged by the law, but actually, it does just the opposite. If we look in uh, Romans, uh, well, first, let's begin in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Let me bring up my PowerPoint for you. Follow along with me here. But uh, uh, you'll see here in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that not only does the sin nature remain untouched by the law, but it is excited or made more sinful by the law. 1 Corinthians 15, 56, Paul says the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, what makes sin more sinful is the law, okay? And uh, if we look at uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, notice what Paul says about this. 
says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. In other words, again, Paul is telling us that the law tells us what sin is. It defines sin for God's people, okay? He says, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So, so what Paul is telling us here is, if there's no law, then there's no sin, okay? Because again, uh, what, what is sin? Well, sin is the breaking of a law. So if we don't have a law, then we can't break it. But when the law comes, when we have a law, when we're given the law, and we break that law, that is what is defined by a sin by God. So as long as this sin nature is alive within us, what happens is the law has a tendency to stir up the lust of that nature to act sinfully. Uh, we, we can see this a lot with our children. When you tell your children not to do something, you know automatically they're going to try to do it. Amen? That's, that's, that's that sin nature acting up against the law, okay? Because the reason it acts that way is because the law is at enmity with God, amen? The law is contrary to God. It can obey God. It's at enmity with God. Is everything opposite to God. And so when the law is given by God, what do we do? We rebel against it, okay? That sin nature rebels against it, okay? And this is what we're seeing in, in, our, in America today. This is what we're seeing in all this darkness, this wickedness that's coming upon America today. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned Christ. You mentioned the, 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 the Bible. You mentioned the Word of God. And, and what do people do? They immediately, it's like something inside of them, and we know exactly what it is. That sin nature is stirred up, and they rebel against that. They're, they, you have to understand the root of all sin is pride. And the very definition of pride is to, to worship and to be worshiped and served, okay? That was the fall of Satan. He fell because of pride, okay? He wanted to be worshiped and served in the place of God. Well, that's what is at the root of the sin nature in man. We want to be worshiped and served, okay? That's the root of that. So, so when we are confronted with the law of God, when God says, uh, 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 they, thou shalt not kill, or God says, uh, he, he, he defines, uh, certain sexual sins as as uh, uh, sexual acts as as sin as abominations to him as uh, going against the, the nature and character of who God is and so what do we do we rebel against that why because that's that sin nature that does not want anybody especially God to tell him what to do and that's what Paul is talking about here in uh, uh, Romans seven and uh, uh, eight. When the, when the commandment comes, when the law is put before us, it produces all manner of evil desire because the sin nature wants to do the opposite of the law. The sin nature wants to do the opposite of God. Whatever God says, it wants to do the opposite, okay? And so uh, the, the purpose then is that uh, uh, to get it, number one, to, to, to define sin so we know what sin is, but the purpose of law is also given uh, to make us realize our need for Jesus Christ, somebody to set us free from this nature of sin. In other words, we come to the place where we realize we are sinners. We've got a problem. We're under the power of sin. We do things that we don't really want to do. We're continually being uh, 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 pressured from inside by this nature of sin to do, to do wrong things. And that's what the whole book of, of Romans 7 is about. Paul is talking about his struggle before he came to Christ uh, when he was a Pharisee and under the law, uh, he was actually a teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee. He, was a, he, he, he taught the law, but he found out, he discovered, even though he followed the letter of the law, there was a problem uh, uh, on the inside, okay? And uh, whereby, although P, uh, Paul may have been following the letter of the law on the outside, inside he found out that uh, he was a sinner, that inside of him, uh, there was an issue whereby uh, 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 th th this, this sin uh, was inside of him and uh, thereby making him a sinner. And that, that uh, 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 got Paul's attention 
And that's what led him uh, to this encounter with Christ so that he could be changed from the inside out. And, and this really relates to uh, Matthew chapter 23 when Jesus confronted the uh, uh, confronted the, the uh, scribes and Pharisees about this very issue. And notice what Jesus says. And this is what Paul is talking about himself, okay? Notice what Jesus says to these uh, scribes and Pharisees. In verse 23 of Matthew 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Okay? Now notice what he says. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier manners of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and follow a camel. No, was Paul, Jesus was telling these, these scribes and Pharisees, you, you follow the letter of the law. You demand that everybody file every tit and jot, okay? But that wasn't the issue. The issue was inside there was a problem. In other words, their motivation, the condition of their heart was, was defining what they were doing. So he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, will you for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. In other words, the issue wasn't following the letter of the law. The issue was the condition of their hearts. Their hearts were unclean. Their hearts were lawless. Their hearts were, were selfish and, and seeking a self-indulgence. Okay, So he says, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, then the outside may be clothed. A uh, 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 clean also. And then notice what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly, now watch this, outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So this is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. Paul was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He considered himself a, a follower of the law to the T. You, you know, he, he, he felt like he was a righteous, you know, because he followed the letter of the law. But then he, he found out that the problem wasn't, the, wasn't following the law by the outside. He found out there was something in his heart, okay? He found out the problem was in his heart. He had sin. And so uh, uh, that was the issue. And because of that, it would make him sin. And we can see that manifested. Paul thought he was doing something righteous when he was attacking the church. He was going around and arrest, arresting Christians. He was thrown to jail. He was having them killed, put to death, put in prison. Okay, And he didn't even recognize that as sin. And he was actually fighting against God himself, uh, uh, coming against Christ. Through his church, remember what Jesus said, if you, whatever you do the least of these, you do it unto me. So Paul didn't even recognize his sinfulness because of his blindness uh, uh, being under the law and not having that nature of sin dealt with within him. Okay, So the purpose of the law or the purpose of the law is to get us to realize our need for Christ. When we recognize how sinful we are in relationship to God, okay? Uh, we, we, we need somebody to set us free from this nature of sin. And that's what Paul discovered, okay? He says, uh, uh, woe is me, who can deliver me from this body of death, okay? So, so that was Paul's cry. He needed somebody to set him free when he realized that the problem wasn't outside, the problem was inside his heart, okay? It's only then, when we come to Christ, when we realize our need, we come to Christ, it's only then that we can actually fulfill the requirements of the law as Jesus gave them to us. And again, if you go back and you read the, 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 uh, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gave us the, 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 the laid out the, the Sermon on the Mount. And he told us all these things about the blessings of God in that. But you'll notice within that he says, you don't have to actually commit adultery to be an adulteress. If you have lust in your heart, it's the same thing as actually committing the act. He says you don't have to actually go out and murder somebody. If you have hatred in your heart, it's the same as being a murderer. So this is what we're talking about. So we can do all the right things outside, but if our inside is unclean, then we're hypocrites. And Jesus says uh, we're like whitewashed uh, tombs 
and and, and uh, we're not going to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because God judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. It's about the heart condition of man. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7. He says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, went into the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father is in heaven. And what did they say to him in reply? But Lord, we've worked uh, prophesied in your name. We, we've done many wonderful works in your name. We, we, we've worked miracles in your name. What did Jesus say? Depart from me. I don't know you. Now notice what he says. You workers of lawlessness. In other words, Jesus was saying, the problem isn't what you're doing outside. The problem is what's in your heart. Your heart is out of order. Your heart is unclean. Your heart is corrupted. And therefore, everything you do is corrupted. Okay. And it's this habitual sin that uh, is a result of that sin nature that brings about the curse of the law. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, as Paul tells us this. Curses is everyone who does not continue in all things. I'm sorry, I missed the first one. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, Paul is telling us that there is a curse on you if you are under the law, which you know Israel was under the old covenant. And to be honest with you, are many people in the church today are still under the law because, again, they're not dealing with the root of the problem. And so they're being taught how to control sin, which is not what the gospel is about. Okay, They control it by... Uh, 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 using their will to follow rules and regulations. And that is what the law is. So Paul is telling us, you're cursed if you're under the law. Why? Because if you don't do every single thing in the book of the law, then you're under a curse. Okay? That's the problem. Nobody can, nobody can follow all those rules and regulations perfectly. It just won't happen, especially because of that nature of sin that is making you to sin, that is causing you to break the law, okay? So he tells us, but no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. In other words, the law is not based, by living a, by, 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 is not, uh, based on living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. It is based on following rules and regulations. In other words, it is an outward thing rather than an inward thing. And that's the big difference between the law and grace. As long as we try to live under the law of rules and regulations, that is, by the flesh, we are under a curse. Why? Because your flesh is an enemy with God and your flesh cannot obey God. So then in the flesh, we're unable to fulfill the law because the sin nature will not allow us to do it. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind, the, the old man, the body of sin, this, this sin nature, okay, is enmity against God. In other words, it goes against the nature of God. It is the opposite of God, okay? Why? For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Okay? It will never obey the God, obey the law of God. Why? Because the law does just the opposite. It stirs up sinful passions in the heart of man. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. As long as you are living a life that is that is under the, the control of sinful flesh, you cannot please God. You can't obey his word. You can't fulfill his commandments. And uh, you, you, you're not going to make it, okay? Because again, this is what Jesus came to do. He came to deal with this very issue right here. And as long as we do not obey God, we're displeasing to him. And therefore, we're what? We are failing to bear the fruits of righteousness, which Jesus came to produce in us, okay? We are commanded to be perfect or holy. And yet, the problem is the old covenant law cannot do it. Why? Because of its inability to deal with our flesh. The law cannot affect the flesh. It is an outward form. It is a ritual. It is based on outward rules and regulations. And it's our flesh that keeps us from that true intimacy and union with God. And again, if you go back and listen to last week's, we talked about the fellowship with God and how uh, if we're not living 
in the light, living in obedience to God, that we we don't have that intimacy with Him. Okay, and that's what it all is all about. God has called us into this intimate one with one this with Him, whereby uh, we live in Him and Him in us. Okay, so it's only by embracing the finished work of Christ that we can be delivered from the sin nature. Okay, we are then brought into obedience to God. And thus we fulfill the requirement of the law so that we can draw near to God. We can come into that intimate one intimate oneness whereby God literally comes and dwells inside these temples uh, as uh, his people. He's our God. We are his people. We fulfill the requirement of the law. Okay. So God did what the law could not do. How did he do it? By sending Jesus Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh. God sent Jesus uh, in a human body subject uh, to to temptation, just as we are subject to the same things we face in this life, okay, to become uh, uh, the means of salvation uh, by becoming a sacrifice to fulfill the requirement of God's law. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, notice what he tells us, uh, Paul tells us here, for what the law could not do, why? That it was weak through the flesh, as long as that nature of flesh, that that's lust, that pride is in your heart, okay, it, it makes the law weak. It cannot produce the actual work of God to change our heart and to make us righteous in order to give us eternal life. So what does he do? The law couldn't do it. So God did what he did. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So again, Paul is explaining to us the problem with the law is it is not able to, to make us righteous because it, does the, it, it causes the flesh to rise up in rebellion rather than submit to the will of God. Because it's at enmity with God, it cannot obey the law of God. Okay, so uh, what did God do in order to solve that problem? God sent Jesus Christ, His own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and He condemned. Okay, He did away. He 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 provided the means to do away with sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Okay, and how is it fulfilled in us? Because Jesus Christ came to remove the stony heart of sin and flesh and to give us a brand new heart, a new spirit, and put his Holy Spirit in us so that now we no longer live, we no longer walk in the lust of the flesh, we no longer live after the lust of the flesh, we now live and walk according to the Spirit of God. We now live uh, 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 and walk but being led by the Spirit of God who does what? He leads us in obedience. He leads us in a life of righteousness. Now, you'll notice he tells us here that what happens is through this redeeming work of Christ, what does he do? He fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. And what is that righteous requirement? Okay, well, if we go back to uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, he tells us what that requirement is. He says, now Israel what does the Lord your God require of you? Okay, here's what God requires of every one of us. And again, you have to understand that this, the same requirement he gives Israel in the old covenant, he gives to us in the new covenant. The only difference is we now are enabled to fulfill the rights and requirement of God and to do the things he called us to do because of the work of Christ. So he tells us what, is, what does God require of us? But to fear the Lord your God. How do we do that? To walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of his Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. That's exactly what the New Testament tells us. What did Jesus say? How do we fulfill the, 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 this, this uh, uh, new life with God? By loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And what does he tell us? What does it mean to love God? To obey his commandments. And what has God called us to do? Why did he give us his Holy Spirit? To empower us to be his witnesses, to serve God. In other words, everything that God required 
back there in Deuteronomy of Israel, he requires of his church today. But again, we now have, have the redemptive word of Christ, which allows us to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law through Jesus Christ as we live a, a life by faith in Jesus Christ, being led by the Spirit of God. So the weakness of the law, and which brings about that curse, is its inability to remove that sin principle of flesh and thus keeping us from fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law. So Jesus took care of this weakness by condemning or depriving sinful flesh of its power. Jesus alone enables us to walk in righteousness according to the Holy Spirit. So to be under the law is to be under the dominion of sin. To be under grace is to be free from the power of sin. So we have to understand this because, again, we have a lot of false doctrine out here in the church today. Grace is not a license to sin. Amen? Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a cover-up for continued sinning. Grace is God's power to deliver us from sin. Amen? Grace is God's power to deliver us from sin. Notice what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Okay, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, So grace doesn't give you power to uh, give you license to sin. Grace gives you power to deliver you from sin and its dominion so that you're not under the dominion of sin. You're not under the slavery of sin. You're not under the power of sin anymore because of the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Okay, So as long as we continue to live in habitual sin, what are we doing? We are still living under the law and the power of sin. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8, uh, verse 36, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. As long as you are committing sin, you're a slave of sin. That's, that, that means had to, sin has dominion over you. Jesus came to do what? To set us free from sin. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He came to deliver you from the dominion of sin. So you are no longer under the power of sin. You are under the power of God's grace. Amen. That delivers you from sin. So, as long as we're still living on the law and the power of sin, we are not living in true union with Christ. We are instead, really what we're doing is, we're living in adultery uh, as to our relation with Christ. In, in fact, really, the, the reality is, uh, if you're still under the power of sin, then you're not under the power of Christ. Uh, uh, now, now, unless you've just Unless you've just yielded to do it and, and it's just beginning to start that process of going back under sin, uh, the reality is, like Jesus said, if your heart hasn't been purified from sin, he never knew you. You can say, Lord, Lord, all you want. But if you're not obeying God and doing the will of the Father, then Jesus says you're still lawless and therefore you are not in the kingdom of God. And again, you can read Second Peter chapter 2. And he explains there that you can get saved and then go back into sin. And if you're overcome by that sin, you come back under the dominion of that sin. You become enslaved to that sin. And so uh, you literally depart from the living God. That sin hardens your heart and the Holy Spirit is going to leave. And uh, you'll be right back where you were before that. Okay. Let's look at Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 1 through 4. Notice what Paul says. Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Now, he is relating this to the nature of sin in man. In other words, Paul is saying the law has dominion over you as long as the old man, Adam, as long as that nature of sin lives within you, as long as it is act within you, you are under the law, okay? Now, though she says, but if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband, okay? So, if the old man dies, we are released from the law uh, of, uh, of, that, of that sin nature. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress, okay? If you try to... to 
to come into, uh, or if you uh, actually under this, when, when you're saved, that, that old man is put to death. So that's not an issue here. But if you get saved and then go back into sin, you're doing the same thing. You become an adulteress with God, okay? Because you are trying to live in two worlds. You're trying to live under the law and live under grace at the same time. And that's impossible. You can't do that. Okay. It's either one or the other. Either you're under bondage or you're not. You're under dominion or you're not. You're under grace or you're under the law. You can't be under both. Okay. So notice what she says. Notice what Paul says. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now, not, now watch what Paul says right here. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. What is Paul telling us? The way Jesus came to do what? To deliver us from the law that, and to bring us. Uh, 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 how does he do that? By delivering us from the nature of sin so that what? We can be set free from the law of sin and death, and we can come under the law of the spirit of life, okay? The spirit of life, amen? So that what? We can now be married to another. So we are delivered from that, that spirit of, of Adam, that sin nature of Adam, who is under what? The power of Satan. And again, go back and listen to last week. If you want to look at that, okay? But notice what Paul says, okay? Once we're set free from that, we are now free to marry Jesus, to marry the one, okay, that was raised from the dead in order that what? So that we can bear fruit to God. Again, our purpose of being married to Christ, our purpose of coming into this divine union with Christ is so that we can serve him, we can bear fruit to God. That's our purpose. Again, going back to how do we fulfill the requirement of the law? We not only love God with our heart, soul, and strength, we serve him with all our heart, soul, and strength. So notice what Paul tells us here. As long as we, as long as that sin nature of self is alive, we are under the dominion of the law. Until that nature dies, until it is crucified with Christ, there is no release from the power of sin. You cannot live in union with Christ while still living in the sin nature or flesh because that would be an adulterous relationship with God. Remember what God kept telling Israel over and over again, he called them adulterers. Why? Because of their idolatry. They kept going and worshiping other gods. When you have the nature of sin in you, what are you doing? You're worshiping another god. What's that other god? It's you. You are an idolater. And God rebuked them for their idolatry in the Old Testament. He called them adulterers and he judged them for it. He cast them into uh, brought judgments upon them. He cast them away from himself. He sent them into uh, uh, into slavery in other nations. He would judge them for that adultery. Well, it's the same thing with us. God, you cannot live an adulterous relationship with God. You cannot live with idols, be in, in, in idolatry, and have that right relationship with God, okay? That sin nature has to be put to death so that we are free to marry someone else who is Jesus Christ. We are called into this marriage relationship with Christ so that we can bear fruit to God. You cannot serve two masters. Amen. That's what Jesus told us. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot please God while still in the flesh. God requires us to have a perfect heart towards him alone. There is no other idol. There is no self-seeking. We're going to have a single eye for him alone. He is to be uh, uh, the preeminence of our life. He is to be our, our sole desire, our first love, our preeminence. He is to be the one we live for above everything else, okay? Listen, Paul even tells us God is a jealous God, okay? God is a jealous God. He will not accept anything less than our all. We have to come to him fully surrendered, fully given over to him, in absolute surrender. We're not our own. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We live to, to, to glorify God in body and spirit. We are to live a life of total consecration to God, to do his will, to live for him, to love him, to serve him, to please him with all of our being. Amen. Look at James tells us in James chapter four, verse eight. Notice he tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, what is James saying? You've got to, you have to receive the full work of Christ in order to, to, to be in right relationship with God, whereby you're not a, 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 an adulterer. Okay, and how is that done? Again, through the redemptive work of Christ. How are our hands cleansed? They are cleansed by our repentance, whereby God forgives us of all our sins, everything we have done, but then our hearts have to be purified. How do we purify our hearts? Well, it's done, done by the Holy Spirit applying the blood of Christ to, 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 to take all the sin out of our hearts, out of our bodies, minds, souls, and spirits, and to make us clean before God. Now, to be double-minded means what? It's to have divided affections, okay? To be double-minded, James tells us, is to be double-minded is to be unstable in all your ways and not to expect anything from the Lord if you're double-minded. That's a dangerous place to be, okay? So again, we need to maintain that oneness with God. We need to stay in that place of singleness of heart and mind and live a life by the Spirit of God, by faith and grace, and uh, and, and maintain that relationship with Him. So in summation, the Old Covenant is based on the law of God. And that law was insufficient to make us perfect or holy because it could not affect the heart of man. It could not destroy the sin nature of man. And therefore, it could not produce a practical righteousness in the heart of man to freely obey God and have this abiding intimacy with him. God requires obedience from us. Therefore, a new covenant was needed in order to overcome the deficiencies of the old covenant so that we could be, be a holy people in union with Christ and fulfill the plan of God in righteousness. We can serve him in righteousness. We work the works of righteousness by Christ Jesus. And this is exactly what we, we must see and understand concerning our new covenant with Christ. The, the new covenant has the power to transform us from within, like Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 23, cleanse, cleanse the inside of the cup, and the outside will be clean also. So the new covenant has the power to transform us from within to make us perfect even as he is perfect. The power to make us holy even as he is holy. The power to impart into us a new nature of righteousness to live in an abiding, intimate fellowship with God. And this is really what the glorious church is. This is the church that Jesus Christ is coming back to present to himself. A glorious church without spot or blemish or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blame, uh, blameless before God. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to make us those people so that when Jesus comes, we'll be prepared and, and ready and watching. Meaning what? That we are fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law. By how? By fearing God, walking in all of his ways, loving him and serving him with all our heart, soul, and strength, obeying his commandments and keeping his judgments and statutes for our good. Why? So that we can have life. We can have the, 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 the uh, inheritance of eternal life with God uh, forever and ever. So God's new covenant is based on grace and truth that comes through Jesus Christ. Notice what John tells us in John 1.17. For well, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to set us free from sin and flesh, to purify for himself a people who walk and live in righteousness. We live in newness of life. We live in obedience to God. We live unto God. Amen. We live a life to please God. So like Paul so vehemently declared to the Roman church in uh, Romans chapter 6, Verse 1 and 2, notice what Paul told them, okay? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Notice Paul is basically saying, are you crazy? Don't you understand what Jesus came to do? Didn't you get it when I explained the gospel to you? Okay, now notice he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Okay, notice what Paul says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? In other words, if we're truly dead to sin, 
if we have died to the law through the work of Jesus Christ, then how in the world can we even think about living in sin? How in the world can we even think about committing sin anymore? That should be foreign to us. We should have no relationships with sin whatsoever. Amen. Because Jesus changed us from the inside out. So, to justify the, continue, the continued existence of sin and idolatry within the church is really to do what? To despise or denigrate the very grace of God. In other words, it is to say God's grace is not sufficient for you. God's grace could not do the work that Jesus sent it to do. Okay? Now, God has been declaring uh, 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 this, this uh, well, listen up. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch up on here. I think the next time, because this whole, this whole next section is 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 moving us to the next step on this. So I'm gonna save this for next Tuesday, and we'll get into this again. But I need you to see in all of this that this is the whole purpose of having a new covenant. What what the Book of Hebrews explains as a better covenant with better promises, a better a sacrifice, a better priest a better uh, a promise, better everything. Everything about this new covenant is, is, is better because it could do what the old covenant can do. And what could the old covenant do? Could not do? It could not make us righteous. It could not affect the heart of man. It left us in a condition of sin. And that sin nature keeps us from obeying the, the laws and commandments of God. And so we continue to go into that sin and uh, come against the things of God. So Jesus came with this new covenant, and the whole purpose of this new covenant is to make us into a new creation, whereby everything about our life becomes brand new. Amen. We have a new heart. We have a new spirit. We're given a new mind. Everything is new. He washes all the clean, the, the old, in the blood of Jesus Christ. All the old is removed. The stony heart of flesh is cut out. All the defilement and corruption of sin, all the idolatry and iniquity is washed out of us by the blood of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit makes us clean. Okay, we are forgiven, but the guilt and shame is removed and we are made brand new. The Holy Spirit is put in us. The law of God is put into our hearts and our minds and we are empowered uh, with this new nature of righteous and justice to obey God and to walk in newness of life. And Paul tells us that that is the purpose of this new covenant. We die with Christ. We are buried with Christ. And then we are raised up with Christ to do what? To walk, to live a life in this newness of life, in this, this new uh, 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 life of the Holy Spirit, whereby we can serve God, we can please God, we can carry out God's will and purpose, and we can do it out of a right heart out of a heart with right motivations, a heart of righteousness and justice. Amen. That's what this is all about. That's what we need to understand. That's what we need to get back to. We need to become that glorious church. We need to be that bro that holy bride because that's what Jesus is returning for. He is not coming back for an adulterous church. He is not coming back for a people that are still in idolatry, worshiping and serving themselves, living after the, the lust of their flesh instead of living a life holy and and uh, in consecration to, to God and Him alone, okay? Whereby we no longer live for ourselves. Why? Because like Paul says, we've been crucified with Christ. We no longer live. Christ lives in us, amen? The life we now live in this body of flesh we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. In other words, Paul is declaring to us, that's how we walk out this new life. That's how we walk, uh, no longer under, after the lust of the flesh, but by the Holy Spirit of God to, full, to fulfill the very requirements of God, whereby now we can love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and we can love our neighbor as ourselves, thereby doing what? Fulfilling all of the law. Every law of God is fulfilled when we love him and we love one another. Just read the Bible. It tells you that. Amen. That's what this is all about. And that's why we have got to get serious. We have got to learn the truth because I'm telling you, 
like Jesus said in the writers of the, of the New Testament, particularly Paul talks about, Peter talks about, Jude talks about, there are many. In fact, if you if you believe the words of Christ, God, amen, do you believe what Jesus says? Many are on the wide road of destruction. Many say to me, Lord, Lord. In other words, Jesus keeps saying, there's more in the church that are lost than are saved. Few there be that find the narrow road that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it. Many have found the wide road of destruction. Many have found the wide road that says you can live in sin. You can be disobedient. You can live as you please and still be saved. That's the wide road of destruction. The narrow road which leads to eternal life says we are holy. We, we, we are the glorious church. We're without spot or blemish. We live to please God. We live for God. We walk in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. We obey the commandments of God. We love God and serve Him. We live a life of devotion to Him, to glorify Him. We got to get ready. We're running out of time. I'm telling you, the signs are here. We are running out of time. We are seeing all the birth pains that Jesus explained to us, the, 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 the beginning of sorrows in Matthew chapter 24. All of those are present right now. We are at the, at the door of the great tribulation. That's the beginning of the seal. After, the, after these, these birth pangs run their course, these, these, these beginnings of sorrows, once they've run their course, we are entering into the seven, the seven seals of the tribulation. So we got to get ready. You've got to get ready. You've got to get ready. Go back. I did a sermon on, on uh, uh, how, how to examine your health, so how to know if you're in the faith, if you're in the right condition, ready and, and, and prepared for Christ. Because the biggest, uh, the biggest characteristic of the last day church is deception, lawlessness because of deception, because people are deceived into thinking that they're saved when they're not. Just, just look at the word deception in the New Testament. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Just do a word search on the way the word deception and deceive in the New Testament, and you'll see that every instance it is talking to people in the church that profess to know Christ. And the deception is that, just that. They think they're saved and they're not. And that's a dangerous place to be. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for what Jesus Christ came to do to bring us a better covenant, to, to make us a people not like Israel, but a people. That, that through the redeeming work of Christ and the blood, the all-sufficient blood of this new covenant can make us into new creations whereby we can live a life pleasing you. We can be delivered from this, this the power of sin, the dominion of sin, that we can be delivered from the law and brought into this, 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 this dominion of grace and faith, this new nature of Jesus Christ, this new nature of righteousness and holiness. We can be brought into the place whereby we fulfill the requirements of the law. We can serve you. We can love you. We can please you. We can become new creations in Christ Jesus. And we can live and walk out this life in newness, free from the law, free from sin and death. And walk under the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus as we are led by the spirit of God. Father, I just thank you for this mighty work. But I pray, Lord, that you would break open the eyes of the understanding of these people that have been deceived, that are lukewarm, that, that are tares among the wheat, that, that, Lord God, are disobedient and living a life of deception. Father, I pray that you convict them, that you break through the blindness of heart, the darkness of understanding, that, Father God, you would pour out the spirit of fear of God upon them and bring them back, cause them to see themselves in the light of your holiness. Give them those Isaiah 6 moments, Father God. Bring about those Damascus Rose moments for these people of God before it's too late. Lord God, convict them. Bring them back to the cross. Bring them to the truth that will set them free. And raise up your glorious church. God, I pray that you move upon the hearts and minds of people all across the body of Christ and bring them into the place to be in the glorious church, the holy bride of Jesus Christ, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, to be holy and blameless, before you. So when Jesus comes, everything will be prepared. They will be prepared. They'll be ready that none would perish, but all, 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 all would come to repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ. In your holy name, I pray, Lord, that you do this work. Bring it forth in power and demonstration because it's already finished. We just not need to believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. And again, if you're sick, if you're dealing with, with, with uh, spiritual issues, 
and, and uh, uh, attacks of the enemy right now. I want to I want to declare to you, number one, make sure that you give no place to the enemy. Get the, the make sure you you kind of entered, entered into the, the full redemptive work of Christ and you've embraced this work because again, flesh gives place to the enemy, it gives him legal right to to uh, attack you and come against you. And again, you go back, uh, the last two Sunday services I did was all about overcoming the wicked one. And, and you have to understand that if you want to walk in victory, particularly in this hour that we're living in, because the devil knows his time is short and he is doing everything he can to kill, steal, and destroy anybody who obeys the commandments of God or has a testimony of Christ. He's coming after you, okay? So get out of that. Make sure you're right with God, okay? And then uh, I proclaim to you right now that you are free from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ, when he delivers you, when he redeems you from sin, when he makes you a new creation, he, he redeems you from the curse of the law. You are free in Jesus' name. Therefore, you are free from sickness and disease. Why? Because Jesus Christ bore your sickness and disease upon the cross of Calvary. Amen. He forgives not only your sins, but he healed all your diseases by his stripes. You are already healed. Amen. I proclaim to you right now. I speak into your body, into your heart, into your mind. In the name of Jesus Christ, by his stripes, you are healed. In Jesus' name, rise up and be healed. In Jesus' name, I speak life into you right now. I bind every oppressive spirit. I command every demon to loose you right now. In Jesus' name, I cast down every spirit of sickness, disease, death, and destruction coming against you. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the blood of a lamb, I declare you are healed right now. I release miracles to you right now. I send forth the word of God. By his stripes you are healed. I proclaim his name, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you right now in Jesus' name. Let the faith of Christ arise in you. Take hold of the promise and be set free right now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, it is finished, it is done. Amen. Jesus Christ makes you whole. In Jesus' name, give your testimony, amen, that others would hear and believe and turn themselves to Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God, hallelujah. Again, thank you for being with me. Uh, praise God. I appreciate all of you joining me on Facebook Live as well as free conference call. Please share this video. People have got to hear the truth. We're running out of time. Listen, a whole lot of people could be like those five foolish virgins or that man that hid his talent or like those goats at the right hand of Christ. There are many in the church are going to be shocked when they find out the door is shut and there's no entrance. And if we're not telling the truth, if we're not leading to the truth, if we're not doing our part, their blood is on our hands. Because we are called to exhort one another daily as, as long as it is day. We are to warn each other. We are to keep each other. We are to watch out for each other. When you see your brother in sin, when you see your sister in sin, you have responsibility as a Christian to warn them, to, to, to in love, go to them and help them see the truth, to turn them from that road that's going to lead to death and destruction. Okay? And listen. We've got tons of them in the church today, and Christians aren't doing anything about it. And we're going to have that blood upon our hands if we're not telling. I'm warning everybody I know. I am telling the truth. I am putting the word out and doing everything I can to, to, to break through the hardness of our, break through the lies and deceptions, the doctrines of demons, and to get people right and prepared and watching and waiting for the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm called to do. Prepare the glorious church of Jesus Christ. Raise up the holy bride, a people that are watching and waiting and doing what Jesus said to do. Amen. Faithful people over the household of God. Praise God. Again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. I'm coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. I will be back Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, you don't want to miss that one. It's going to be a good one. Praise God. And again, if you follow me on Facebook, you will be notified because I'm popping in here and there because there's an urgency burning in my heart to make disciples, to get the church ready, and to get the word out as much as I possibly can. So follow me, and you'll be notified every time I go online, and there'll be a different times uh, in between my, my Sunday mornings every week, 
Tuesday nights every week. And in between, I'm trying to fit others ones in and uh, also doing in-person ministry as well. So God bless you. I pray that you have a wonderful week and you continue to press into the Lord. Keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. Listen, we are one day closer today to the coming of Christ. You better get ready because that is a fact. You can take it to the bank. Amen. Love you and appreciate you. Have a blessed week in the Lord and keep seeking him. He loves you and so do I. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.